Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. I would like to remind you that this conference is being recorded. At the moment, all participants are in a listen-only mode. For those that are connected by telephone require operator assistance during the call, please press star zero. For those online that require assistance, please use the chat box on your screen. I would like to now hand the meeting over to your host, Jessica Fournier, Improvement Lead at Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement. Please go ahead. Good day, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Jessica Fournier, and I'm your host for today's webinar, which is the fourth webinar in CFHI's new discussion series, Community Dementia Care and Support, Innovation Supporting People Living with Dementia and Care Partners Closer to Home. We are pleased to offer French simultaneous interpretation on today's webinar. If you would like to see and hear the presentation in French today and you have not yet been transferred, you can let us know in the chat box on the bottom right of your screen. Once you have been transferred, you will need to shut down your computer speakers and dial the number on the screen. We also invite you to share your questions and comments at any point using our chat box in either English or French. We will reserve verbal discussion of comments and questions to the end of the webinar, but encourage all of you to respond to comment and answer questions in the chat as you wish as we go along. Also, a note that we will summarize the chat questions and comments after the webinar and translate this to both official languages for sharing in a post-webinar synopsis. The post-webinar email will also include links to the recording of today's session. Thank you to all for answering the lobby poll question. Our participants for today include representatives from across Canada. We are joined by representatives from regional health authorities, universities, Alzheimer's societies, research centers, Dementia Advocacy Canada, ministries, Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technology and Health, Canadian Institute of Health Research, Health Canada, Public Health Agency of Canada, community support organizations, dementia care organizations, retirement and long-term care homes, Center for Aging and Brain Health Innovation, AgeWell, Canadian Frailty Network, Canadian Medical Association, Royal College of Family Physicians, and government health departments across Canada, as well as many others. Before we go further, I want to begin this webinar by acknowledging that we are meeting on land that has been inhabited by Indigenous people since the beginning. In particular, we acknowledge that I am hosting this webinar from Perth, Ontario, which is the traditional territory of the Ashinaabek, Huron-Wendat, and Odinasani St. Lawrence Iroquois peoples. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties. I encourage you all to share in the chat box the territory and land you are joining us from today. Our CFHI team involved in creating and producing this webinar series includes Tanya McDonald, Jennifer Major, and myself, Jessica Fournier. Sheena, Kelly, and Isabel are behind the scenes producing the webinar. Our presenters today are Christine Votova, Dr. Alex Henry Bargava, Shelley Doucette, and Allison Luke. Christine, thanks for being here today. Over to you to introduce yourself. My name is Christine Vitova. Can I be heard? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. My name is Christine Vitova, and I'm a director with Medical and Academic Affairs at Island Health, which is our regional health authority here on Vancouver Island, British Columbia. In my role, I oversee large regional medical staff quality improvement and change management initiatives, such as physician quality improvement and health system redesign. Um, I am trained in medical sociology and gerontology and an adjunct professor at Medical Sciences, University of Victoria. I'm also a current co-investigator on research grants for palliative care, implementation science and technology in older adults, as well as cognitive health, which is the focus today. I currently live, work and play on Vancouver Island with my family and enjoy recreating in the beautiful West Coast waters and trails. Thank you. Thank you, Christine. Alex, would you please introduce yourself next? I'm a neurologist by uh, trade and, and uh, with a focus in, in behavioral neurology. I uh, have a clinical associate professor appointment at the University of British Columbia and a uh, cross appointment and in the Division of Medical Sciences at University of Victoria. Uh, and I work uh, primarily at Island Health as well. I'm here presenting to you as the medical director for the Cognitive Health Initiative, which you'll learn about uh, in part of today's uh, webinar, and I also live and play in Victoria with my family, which is a great place to be. Thank you, Alex. Shelley, over to you to introduce yourself. I'm Shelley Doucette, and my background is in nursing, 
and I'm, I live in St. John, New Brunswick. I'm connected with the University of New Brunswick, where I'm a, an associate professor in nursing and health sciences. I'm also the director for the Center for Research and Integrated Care, and I hold a research chair, this is the Jarosowski Chair in Interprofessional Patient Center Care. And I'm also the co-director of Navicare Slenavy, which is what we'll be talking with you about today. Thank you, Shelley. And Allison, would you please introduce yourself? Hi there, my name is Allison Luce. I'm a research associate at the University of New Brunswick, St. John campus. Um, I'm housed out of uh, nursing and health sciences, but my background is actually in sociology. And uh, I am also co a co-director of Navicare Soin Navi, which is what we will, Shelley and I will be presenting today. And uh, I live in and play in St. John on the beautiful Bay of Fundy. Great, thank you, Allison. We also have our session moderators, Mimi Lowy Young and Mary Beth Whiten, who will lend their expert perspective to the information presented and to the comments and questions you enter in the chat. Mimi, over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, and I'm very pleased to be here. Uh, I'm Mimi Lowy Young, and I'm the former CEO of the Alzheimer's Society of Canada. And now I am the chair of AgeWell, a uh, federally funded network, Centers of Excellence, uh, focusing on um, technology uh, innovation to support healthy aging and support people with dementia. Uh, I'm also a senior fellow and adjunct faculty at the University of Toronto's Institute for Health Policy Management and Evaluation. Thank you. Thank you, me. And Mary Beth, over to you for a brief introduction of yourself and the expertise and experience you bring to this conversation today. Hi, good morning everyone. My name is uh, Mary Beth Whiten and I'm a person living with a diagnosis of probable front temporal dementia. I am a dementia advocate and I live in Southampton, Ontario. I'm also uh, a co-chair of Dementia Advocacy Canada and I'm a member of the Ministerial Advisory um, Team to the Federal Minister of Health. Great. Thank you, Mary Beth, and thank you all for being here today. So our, our objective for today's session is to provide an overview of the CFHI Community Dementia Care and Support webinar discussion series, broaden awareness and discuss two innovations that can improve early diagnosis and post-diagnostic care and supports in the community, which are Navicare and the Manning Cognitive Health Initiative and facilitate a discussion around the potential spread of innovations to improve care and support in the community for people living with dementia and care partners. CFHI is a not-for-profit organization with a mission to collaborate with partners to identify and spread proven innovations to improve healthcare closer to home and community in areas of shared provincial, territorial, and federal priority. The impact of our work is lasting improvement in patient, family, and caregiver experience and health work life of providers, and value for money. We believe in the collective power for change, so partnering with others where we can add value is essential to our work and vision. Our community dementia discussion series will broaden awareness and discuss innovations that aim to improve timely diagnosis of dementia in primary care and post-diagnostic supports, including coordination and navigation. To find more information about the topics and webinar dates, you can visit our webpage on the CFHI website. If you know someone who would like to attend this webinar, please send them the link to register to receive the information. If you know about an innovation that could be spread across Canada that improves timely compassionate diagnosis in primary care or coordination and navigation of post-diagnostic care and support that would work in the COVID-19 context, please email us at the email provided on the screen to let us know. For your consideration today and throughout the series, what promising innovations exist that could be spread across Canada, including in the COVID-19 context? What is the feasibility of your organization and or community to implement and spread the innovations? Where can CFHI add value to support a multi-jurisdictional approach to spreading these innovations? And what are the partnership opportunities to help spread innovations to improve community dementia care and support? So I'd now like to turn it over to Mary Beth and Mimi to get a bit of their insights. Mary Beth, 
What has been your experience getting a diagnosis and navigating care and support after your diagno diagnosis of dementia? Uh, this is this is such a, an important question. I just want to start off to by saying that um, I am not unique in my experience, and uh, basically I can summarize it just by saying the word: it's been terrible. Uh, before I was diagnosed, it. Um, it was a very long process. It took about two years, and I have about 10 other diagnoses other than uh, dementia. And um, one of the biggest challenges around this was actually stigma within the medical professionals themselves. And um, believe it or not, many of them would say to me, you're just too young to have dementia. After the diagnosis, the lack of education was um, and is transparent with uh, many different groups, in particular of the primary care staff. One of the things that happened right off the, the bat with my doctor was it was really a lack of compassion how um, I was presented the diagnosis. And then I was pushed off to the Alzheimer's Society where the doctor literally didn't want to answer any questions about the dementia, of which is FTD. And, um, and yet, the Alzheimer's Society itself wasn't able to answer the questions about FTD. So, um, you know, really important to understand what your diagnosis is, and yet the doctors and other staff couldn't answer those kinds of questions to me. In addition to that, one of the things that was uh, suggested that if I was having, quote, behavioral issues, um, my partner was told to take me to the hospital and, um, you know, get me evaluated for a psychiatric issues. Other things that uh, really stood out for us was uh, financial education. Um, I had to stop working and so you know, we were looking for questions on what did this mean for our finance, end of life choices, what did that mean for um, you know, what my life could look like near the end, transportation, my license was revoked on the spot when I did receive my my diagnosis, and we really didn't have anyone to go to. For instance, is that you know, should the doctor have actually done that? Were there other ways to do this? And um, the care coordination with again primary cap uh, primary care staff, just surrounding uh, communication, surrounding medication that I'm on and to be on, and conflict of medicate educate medication, um, advanced care planning. You know, all the documentation around that, uh, we have and have didn't receive very much help. And the appointments, just the pure number of different uh, scheduling issues that uh, we, we experience. And, and basically, really, a, you know, a quality of life. We, we weren't encouraged to uh, take every day um, and, and just go with it. Uh, there was nothing said about... Um, uh, rehabilitation, but rather that I would just, you know, get ready to die and go into long-term care. So, you know, lots of different topics that I'm hoping that today we're going to hit on. Thank you, Mary Beth, for sharing and opening up to us today and sharing your experience. Mimi, how can technology improve care and supports in the community? Well, I, I need to speak and comment about this in regards to COVID-19 and how it has changed the world, and most specifically about technology. The opportunities for technology to reduce um, isolation, to support the use of various apps and, and so on, um, that um, older adults and, and adults over the age of 50 feel more comfortable with. I, I want to speak very briefly about a recent survey done by AgeWell um, through Enveronics Research has found that there is an increase in confidence uh, in the use of technology. 72% uh, of, of individuals said they're, they're confident uh, in being able to use technology and social media, and that 65% own smartphones and 83% say they use it daily. The idea of being able to use it for telemedicine and uh, virtual health 
the use of, of those two has increased, as we know, and older adults and adults over the age of 50 feel that they are, uh, they are satisfied with the use of these, of these sorts of technologies, which allows uh, care to come closer to home without the, the worry or the fear of individuals leaving their homes to receive care. So I think there's a huge opportunity. I think we've just um, touched the surface when it comes to the use of technology, and there are many opportunities uh, in the future to support both um, diagnosis and support of people, uh, individuals who are diagnosed with dementia, but as well access to care and support in their own homes. Thank you. Great, thank you Mimi and Mary Beth. At this time I'd like to turn it over to Shelley and Allison. Over to Shelley and Allison to present on Navicare. Great, thank you very much. All right, so I just, how do we make the slide go back? Can we go back a slide? Oh, I think our first slide's missing, but that's okay. Oh, there we go, perfect, thank you. All right, uh, thank you again for having us here today. Uh, Allison and I will be sharing an innovation that's being implemented in New Brunswick called NaviCare Swanavi, which we co-direct, and it's a patient navigation center for children and youth with complex care needs in New Brunswick. In our short presentation, we will describe the development and operations of the Patient Navigation Center, and we will discuss the evaluation and impact, and we'll also share some of the lessons learned. And you're probably wondering, given the focus on children, why we're here today, so we'll end off by discussing how the model can be spread to serve people living with dementia and their caregivers. Next slide. So we'll start off by talking about the development of the center. So it started back in 2015 where we received CIHR funding to do a needs assessment in New Brunswick to explore uh, the needs of children youth with complex care needs. And we interviewed youth, their caregivers, as well as health and social care providers. And they experienced many of the barriers that we just heard about. Um, but one of the main barriers that we, we heard through this research is the challenges that they experienced around navigating the healthcare system. So from this, we decided that we would test their developing a patient navigation center. And in pursuing that, we conducted a couple of environmental scans. The first was doing a scan of pediatric patient navigation programs across Canada uh, to see what else has been done in this area, and also to do a scan in New Brunswick to see what services and programs are available. Plus, we did site visits across Canada and the US as well with other patient navigation programs. Next, we secured funding from the New Brunswick Children's Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization. And once we secured that funding, we developed the policies and procedures, for example, around research and clinical operations. And then we did our hiring and training. So we hired a program coordinator, a patient navigator who was a registered nurse who received motivational interviewing training, and also a postdoc who was trained around process evaluation training. Next, in January 2017, we launched the center. And this, then we followed into more of a marketing and outreach phase where we tried to spread the word about um, the services that we're offering, and then finally developing the evaluation plan. So for example, we developed a logic model, which we've since published, and we'll include that at the end of our presentation. So on the next slide, so I just want to share, you may be wondering, what is NaviCare? So the, the goal of NaviCare, I'm not sure if the slide's showing for others, but I don't see it here. Uh, I'll carry on though. So the goal of NaviCare is to provide more convenient and integrated care to support the physical, mental, emotional, social, cultural, as well as the spiritual needs using a personalized family-centered model of care. The center is bilingual, where New Brunswick uh, has two official languages, and it is a research-based navigation center. The services are offered for free, and they're available from Monday to Friday from 9 to 5, and they're mostly virtual, especially during these COVID times. And clients are not turned away based on their level of complexity, and there's no need for a referral or even a diagnosis, diagnosis to access the center services. And so our patient navigator is a registered nurse who connects families with services and resources across sectors, also helps coordinate patient care, and facilitates transitions in care. So for example, when transitioning from pediatric to adult services. And of course, also acts as a resource for the care team. So I just want to reiterate that the center can be accessed by youth, the caregivers, as well as the care team. So it can really be used by anyone. If you just advance the slide. OK, 
Okay, I'm not sure. I can't see the slides. So it should be at the Family Advisory Council one right now. Okay, Shelly, so the slides okay. are advi yeah. advancing. There might be a bit of a delay, but uh, we'll okay. go along as so we can see. Okay, we'll keep going. So, family, so this center is informed by a Family Advisory Council, which includes seven volunteers, and these are um, young adults who have experienced complex care needs as a child or their uh, parents of care, parents of children and youth with complex care needs. And they meet monthly to advise the research team, staff, as well as the patient navigator. And they also develop resources and help host workshops as well. All right, so now I'm going to move along to the process of working with the patient navigator. And so the process of working with the navigator begins during the first interaction. And this is with an assessment of the client's needs and collection of demographic information. And once these unmet needs are identified uh, by the client, and that's done in support with the navigator, goals are set to address those needs. And then the intervention, which involves providing more personalized, family-centered navigational support based on these identified goals, takes place during the course of the navigator-client relationship. And so the, the, essentially, the, the patient navigator really maintains communication with the client for support and follows up with the, the client as needed throughout the process at which time we found it's really common for new needs to be identified. And the navigator often reaches out to the client's care team to engage care providers and community stakeholders in finding a resolution to unmet needs. So it's a very collaborative approach. And then finally, once the client's needs are resolved, the case is archived, although it's never really closed and it's understood the client can call back at any time when new needs arise. So now I'm going to turn it over to Allison and she's going to talk a little bit more about um, the services that we offer. Thanks, Shelley. So next slide, please. So just in terms of to give uh, folks an idea of the examples of how um, Navicare Swinavi can help or support um, patients, families, or our clients more broadly, there's a real range in terms of what clients um, require from the patient navigator. It could be as simple as preparing a, a list of resources, programs, and services. For instance, somebody may be relocating to a new a new area in the province, and they really just want something to direct them to where they should call themselves, and they want to take it over. Um, but really, most clients have more complex or more complicated needs. They may identify a few goals at the intake process. And in some of our more um, complicated cases, it may be that um, a family, it could be the caregiver, would actually like that list of resources or programs, but they then ask the, the patient navigator to make that phone call to help to get them into the program, maybe get them on a wait list. Sometimes there might even be some issues around accessing funding. Um, there may even be one or two like uh, extra goals that need to be worked with. Our patient navigator has also worked with the care team, meeting with uh, whether it's specialists or people from community programs to help better integrate and coordinate that care plan. Next slide, please. To date, uh, Navicare, we've helped over 200 clients. Um, and just to give you a, a quick overview, most of the calls our patient navigator receives come from caregivers, and it's primarily mothers who call. I would say 30 plus um, of our, our cases come from social and healthcare providers. And this comes from pediatricians, social workers, as well as different individuals who work with community organizations that support uh, this population. Next slide, please. In terms of the evaluation, it is ongoing. And up to this point, the focus has been around the experiences of caregivers and care providers, as well as the satisfaction of our clients. And in fact, all clients receive a satisfaction survey when their case is archived. There have been a number of, of challenges with measuring the impact of Navicare or patient navigation in, in general. Specifically, to date, we have focused on the qualitative aspect by doing interviews. Um, but as we see our numbers grow, we hope to be able to do more quantitative measures in the future, maybe focusing on things such as reductions in ER visits or reductions in missed days at work or school. Our patient navigator also compiles and maintains a list of gaps and barriers, and these would be gaps and barriers in services, resources that have been identified by clients themselves. These are then turned into policy briefs, which we share with, with uh, folks in government and the Department of Health. Next slide, please. 
With respect to uh, some more detail around our evaluation, um, to date we've interviewed uh, upwards of 30 caregivers. And from these, these are semi-structured, you know, longer interviews, and three main themes emerge from those interviews. The first two really refer to the challenges raising a child and youth with complex care needs, which isn't really relevant here. But the third theme was all around the value of patient navigation. So I'm going to share quickly the five sub-themes that came out of that. The first one is this idea that the navigator, quote, she's got my back. So the patient navigator is seen as someone who's in the, in the, the client, the family member's corner, uh, working with them on their journey as they try and navigate the system. The next one is made the entire process so much easier, which of course is accomplished by the patient navigator sort of doing some of that heavy lifting and finding resources. The third one, it was just like talking to an old friend. This very much reflects what Shelley referred to as the personalized and patient or family-centered approach our patient navigator takes. The fourth one is provided the information that I needed. And then the fifth one is that it drastically improved my quality of life. And we did hear again and again that uh, patient navigation helped to reduce stress. Next slide, please. So in terms of um, themes that came out of our care provider interviews, we've conducted 10 of those interviews to date. And a reminder, these are semi-structured. Five themes emerged. The first is around patient navigation as a trusted source. Uh, the second one speaks to the role of patient navigation as a connector, really assisting with that connecting piece where a lot of care providers, they're not necessarily always aware of all the various programs and services available, and so that, that patient navigator acts as that connecting piece. Um, patient navigation is a capacity builder. So the patient navigation isn't just, or navigator, not only just sharing a list of resources, but actively educating, sharing knowledge, trying to build capacity in the community and with clinicians. Uh, the fourth one is around that partner, partnership. The patient navigator works with the care provider to help support them while they care for uh, patients or care, caregivers. And finally, um, patient navigation is a time saver. Next slide, please. In terms of lessons learned, there are four big takeaways that I can share with you. The first is the importance of having a family advisory council um, or a patient and family advisory council when setting up a patient navigation program. The second one is a need to recognize issues around outreach and marketing. For us, we were not embedded, uh, Navicare was not embedded in a clinic or it wasn't um, part of a government program. So we had to do a lot of work around outreach and marketing, and this is something that needs to be front of mind. The third one is around the use of language, so for us around the word complex, which initially was originally in our description of our population, that can cause some issues, so you might need to tweak sort of how you describe your population and what, what you, you do and who you seek to serve. And finally, the last lesson learned is around the need to ensure that other programs do not view patient navigation as a duplication of services, but rather as more that connecting, bridging piece. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, in terms of opportunities for spread and scale, patient navigation is used across a variety of settings with diverse conditions and populations. So we firmly believe that the, the service can be easily adapted for a variety of different populations. We, for instance, can change the method of delivery. Um, although ours has been primarily virtual, patient navigation can be face-to-face -face or it can be a combination of both. Um, the setting, the patient navigator can be housed in a hospital, a clinic, or a community-based setting. Um, we can also vary the type of navigator. We currently have a registered nurse, but navigators can also be uh, lay navigators or people with lived experience. So you can have peer navigators or you can have a combination. In terms of scale and spread that we're currently involved in, we are actually working right now with the NB Trauma Center. Um, and this would be looking at putting a navigator in place in a hospital-based trauma center. And we're also currently working with CFHI to conduct a needs assessment, an environmental scan, scoping review that will inform the development of um, a patient navigation model for people with dementia as well as their caregivers in New Brunswick as well as across Canada. And I'll hand it back to you, Shelley. Great. So next slide. I think we're, we're just wrapping up on time, but I'm, I'm hopeful that the slides will be shared with everyone so they can see the earlier slides. And also, just want to share quickly that our team, in partnership with um, the Family Navigation Project with Sunnybrook, we're hosting a patient navigation conference in April of next year. It was supposed to be April of 2020. 
in person in Toronto, but we've had to postpone it. It's going to be virtual in, in 2021. So the registration for that will be opening up soon. So we hope that those of you can attend who might be interested in this area. And just on the next slide, you'll see some um, contact information. If you, if you proceed to the next slide, just our contact information for the center. And on the final slide, it's just some publications that we've um, published in this area. And we're happy to, to meet with anyone or speak with anyone who might be interested in partnering in some of the work we're doing or you know, explore, uh, asking questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Allison and Shelley, for your presentation. Also, apologies to everybody who wasn't able to see the slides, but today's webinar is recorded, and we will be sharing the slides uh, following this session in case you've missed anything. We would now like to ask you to answer a few questions about Navicare. Prior to this webinar, were you aware of Navicare, yes or no? I know more about Navicare than I did before participating in this webinar. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. I'll give just a few moments um, to let you answer those polls. I also invite you to type any questions you have about Navicare into the chat box, and we will address them in the Q&A portion of our webinar after our next presentation. Uh, thank you for answering that poll. I would now like to hand it over to Christine and Alex for their presentation on the Neil and Susan Manning Cognitive Health Initiative. Thank you. Yes, Christine here. I'll be speaking first. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Henry Bagava, and myself would like to acknowledge the unceded territories on which we work and live is within the traditional territories of the Lenguanquan, Malahat, Pachirat, Shuachnu, Suwuk, and Wasanek peoples. Uh, the photo that we have here is of the First People's House, which is a social, cultural, and academic center for Indigenous students at the University of Victoria that encourages the building of community in a safe space. Next slide. Here we have a disclosure slide, which is a standard uh, procedure for representing financial contributions with the industry-sponsored clinical trials, as well as government-sponsored sponsored as publicly funded, including Doctors of BC engagement funding for our combined research and engagement activities in dementia. Next slide. So here we have the Manning Cognitive Health Initiative. What this is, is a five-year collaboration officially launched in October of 2017, and you'll see the event uh, photo on the left-hand side of your screen. This was an event hosted by the Victoria Hospitals Foundation to honour and recognize the Manning family, who made a generous and significant endowment to advance clinical research and island homegrown solutions for dementia diagnosis and care in the hopes to address the gaps that they experienced during their family's encounter with the healthcare system as they embarked and ongoing through their dementia journey. This marks the largest research donation in the Foundation's history and marks a true partnership with academia and service delivery with matched in-kind funding from the University of Victoria, the University of British Columbia Island Medical Program, and Island Health, which is our regional health authority. Next slide. So here we have a layout of what our action plan is. So the Manning Cognitive Health Initiative is really the first step towards a learning health system. So our success hinges on the collaboration among our partnerships. And while our goal is for regional spread and scale, our current efforts are focused on the South Island and the capital city of Victoria, British Columbia. Now due to time, um, we're only able to focus on a few of our multi-armed, multi-year collaborative activities. For instance, we won't have time to capture the work of our colleagues at the University of Victoria, Institute of Aging and Lifelong Health, who through funding from the Manning Cognitive Health Initiative have developed a cognitive assessment tool in the form of an app called MyCogHealth that enables individuals to monitor intra-individual change. And feasibility validation studies are underway, including work on clinical trials. 
So as we go through our presentation, you'll see these color coding icons somewhere on the slide to sort of indicate what specific action we're, we're speaking to. Next slide. So the Manning Cog and Health Initiative is in alignment with our health authority, provincial and federal priorities, and in particular with the BC Provincial Guide that outlines these four priorities, two of which our initiative hits on. One is to support the prevention and early intervention and public awareness, as well as to increase system support and the adoption of best practices in dementia care. Next slide. So when the initiative launched in the fall of 2017, one of our first priorities was to engage with persons with lived experience and their care partners in a collaborative co-funded dialogue session with the BC Support Unit, Vancouver Island Regional Centre. Some of you may know of SPORE, the Strategy for Patient-Oriented Research. And this was part of our shared mandate to advance patient-oriented research locally. So through facilitated groups, we spent an afternoon in a bridging the gap exercise. So what is your current state experience and how do we get to that ideal future state? We had such tremendous uh, stakeholder engagement with the persons with lived experience. We had the CEO of the BC Alzheimer's Society, uh, Maria Howard, and Isabel McKenzie from the BC Office of the Seniors Advocate to open the event and share the BC vision. It was such a tremendous experience. So we heard about the challenges with dementia diagnosis and we found consistent themes of those shared by the Mannings and as we heard from the outset with Mary Beth, the statement of frustration around the, the encounters and the early detection and, and diagnosis. And Mimi, to your point, we also learned that the attendees reported being very confident and very interested in using technology to support their dementia care. Next slide. One of our first clinical innovations is the development of a memory clinic where specialists provide consultations for persons referred to an existing seniors outpatient clinic for memory concerns as the primary reason for the referral. So the specialist memory clinic has been in operation for almost two years now and the aim of the clinic is to standardize the dementia care pathway and to capture data at the point of care, something that was not being done in a streamlined and comprehensive way prior to the Manning Initiative. The funding has enabled the staffing infrastructure to support embedding research into practice and ongoing quality improvement and redesign. We also set up a governance structure with executive level oversight from our stakeholders, from academia, health service delivery and training. And we use consensus based decision making so all stakeholders are contributing and we have an opportunity to report back to our donor through the foundations. My colleague Dr. Henry Bogava will speak next about the clinical aspects of this program. But what you see here is in the 500 patient consultations we've had in 2020 alone, the, just over half are female, mean age of 78 years, with the majority having a diagnosis of major cognitive impairment. Next slide and over to you, um, Dr. Henry Bogava, Medical Director of the Cognitive Health Initiative. Thanks, Christine. So, <clears throat> To, to get into the uh, details a little bit of what's uh, changed in terms of clinical care at this specialist memory clinic, one of the things we're developing is what's been nicknamed right now the Dementia Guidance System, which is basically a retooling of an existing open source electronic medical record, OSCAR, um, but focused on being able to uh, uh, provide functionality to clinicians who are interacting with patients and also uh, collect data uh, that is uh, particularly germane to the assessment and care of patients who have um, cognitive problems. So I'll give you some examples on the next slide. So at the point of care, uh, the clinicians uh, really are, are uh, going to see a tool that is it just makes life a little bit easier for them. And so I've only shown a few screens, but, but basically what used to be uh, kind of uh, pen and paper uh, capture of, of different uh, uh, pieces of information during the clinical encounter can now be done into the electronic medical record. That's not necessarily anything new under the sun, but we're tailoring the medical record to uh, the cognitive uh, assessment. And then we're incorporating uh, different scales of this screenshot is showing an example of, of the clinical frailty scale in there. On the next slide, 
you can see some examples of outputs that at the end of the visit uh, we can link in, for example, the referral to the Alzheimer's Society First Link program, uh, sending patients for scans, uh, sending patients for uh, other internal uh, um, referrals within our clinic or external referrals uh, elsewhere uh, in the health system on, in, in the city, for example. Um, on the back end, on the next slide, what this allows us to do is to take the information that usually is just stored in the electronic record for clinical purposes and to extract it and to start to build a database that we can learn from and, and learn from our patients. And even before the individual data elements are really um, uh, ready in the system, we can take uh, just plain dictated consult notes even and use uh, machine learning algorithms to, to extract information. So uh, a, a consult note from a physician or a nurse practitioner that starts off, I have the pleasure to review uh, Mr. Smith, who is a 72-year-old gentleman re referred for cognitive imp impairment. While ready, we can start extracting the age, the gender, the reason for referral, et cetera. On the next slide, you see a, uh, an example of that uh, for the entire um, uh, cognitive assessment. And so just from two paragraphs here, uh, there are uh, a, a couple dozen uh, unique data elements that are extracted. And so then uh, that allows us very quickly to accumulate knowledge about the patients that we're seeing and be able to tailor the clinical activities that we do in the clinic to better serve those patients. Next slide. So what this slide would have shown you uh, is that some of the output uh, of the of the system is, and, and there, these were just some examples, but one, what we can do is we can use uh, that data that's extracted to do uh, analysis of, of clusters of risk factors and symptoms so we can better learn who our patients are, what their risk factors are here within our community and allows us to better plan the interventions that we uh, can offer at the clinic. Uh, there was also an example there about how we learn about the, the, the different prescriptions that patients are coming in on so we can learn about the kinds of uh, prescription patterns that they are having in the community as well as the prescription patterns of the clinicians who are seeing them in the clinic here, and then we can compare that to standard of care, best practices, and, and feed that information back to the, to the clinicians. Uh, and, and again, this is the kind of stuff that usually kind of happens in an informal way in any, in any clinic, and this allows us to, to have the data at hand when we, when we have our discussions. Um, so on the next slide, please. Um, and one example of this is at the, the the left-hand side of the slide is familiar to many people. These are the, uh, from the Lancet Commission report uh, showing that uh, potentially 40% of the risk of dementia uh, includes modifiable risk factors. Well, we know that 32% of the patients coming through our clinic are in a pre-dementia state, even though they're referred for concerns about potential dementia. And so we can intervene on some of those modifiable risk factors, such as the hypertension that um, uh, three-fifths of our patients have or the diabetes that a fifth of our patients have. And we can also uh, put into place uh, social interventions such as referral to First Link and other programs that we're developing in-house in terms of cognitive stimulation programs. We can put those programs into place much uh, earlier or, uh, than uh, they would have in, in just their uh, routine family doctor's office. Next slide. Um, this is just an example of uh, where we have a, a system in general that allows us to be able to be a little bit more fluid and adaptive. So many of our activities were shut down in March uh, when uh, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. And in fact, all in-person visits to our clinic were canceled. Uh, we were able to rapidly, uh, within a week, start offering uh, telehealth uh, visits. And telehealth had not been explored in the context of um, assessments of patients with potential dementia and other cognitive uh, disorders. Uh, and w uh, we put into a place an evaluation process so that we could at least learn whether this was acceptable or, or, or um, uh, useful for patients. And to my uh, pleasant surprise, most patients were actually quite satisfied with the uh, telehealth appointments and actually indicated that they would like to have telehealth appointments continue in the future uh, regardless of the pandemic or not. And so this has allowed us to learn a little bit about delivering um, uh, dementia care over telehealth and uh, learning that for those patients who are equipped to undertake telehealth assessments, uh, some of them would actually uh, like this to be a tool uh, for, uh, for, for uh, uh, perpetuity. Um, next slide. 
And so, uh, interestingly, this touches on a question that's coming in the chat box as we, as we talk. Uh, one of the goals, uh, our next goals here is to, uh, as we further develop this dementia guidance system, for example, is to deploy this in a primary care setting. Uh, those of you who were fortunate enough to be on the webinar uh, last month would have heard a presentation by Dr. Linda Lee uh, where she outlined the MINT memory clinic model that she has developed and pioneered in Ontario and that has uh, developed a widespread adoption in a large part of that province. Um, uh, Dr. Lee is uh, uh, consulting with uh, clinicians in other parts of the country to try to spread the model beyond Ontario and we're in discussions right now to expand to up to three uh, initial primary care memory clinics uh, here on uh, Vancouver Island based on her model. The innovation that we would want to add to that is to uh, try to adapt our dementia guidance system for use by the clinicians in these primary care um, memory clinics. Uh, and therefore we could learn what's going on at the primary care level as much as we can at the specialist assessment level. And this is important because we've determined that um, uh, about one-third of all the referrals that we're getting uh, could be seen in the primary care uh, uh, memory clinic setting. Uh, and so in order to build capacity, uh, we're not going to be able to have every patient see a specialist, but those patients in whom uh, properly supported primary care would be able to give uh, an adequate diagnosis and initial um, recommendations, then uh, we, can, we can work with our primary care colleagues to expand capacity that way. Next slide. And so this slide uh, in, in the original PowerPoint was going to fly in at you, so it's, <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's, it's a little bit messy there. Uh, but basically, this is just showing some of the, the uh, ongoing patient engagement that we're doing. Uh, we had a, a story that was featured from a, um, a patient who has come through the clinic uh, who uh, just wanted to, to thank us for uh, having had the opportunity to be assessed at the clinic where he, he felt a little bit lost uh, and uh, his... Uh, uh, other doctors didn't uh, really know how to help him because he had a, quite a, a unique uh, cognitive problem. Uh, we had some, some stories from our, our patients who participated in research. Uh, one of the activities is that uh, as patients come in, they can join a permission to contact program so that if they want their, their information used for research and if they want to be contacted for clinical trials of either uh, pharmaceutical or non-pharmaceutical uh, studies, then they can be contacted. And so some of those patients have found that the interaction, uh, the more direct interaction with research has been quite beneficial. Um, uh, so I, I think we'll end there with just a bit of an overview of the clinical activities that we've had through this cognitive health initiative, really trying to allow people at the point of care to uh, have a more rapid response to how we can um, uh, diagnose and treat patients and uh, put into place uh, interventions uh, tailored to our local populations. On the next slide, there's, there's some acknowledgments. I'd definitely like to acknowledge the Manning family as, as um, Dr. Votova did. Uh, for uh, starting the whole initiative and, and really supporting it all, all the way. Um, special thanks to our data scientist, Dr. Max Bebock, and, uh, and to Ms. Corabell, our, our research assistant, who helped with uh, preparing some of this material, and to the team at Island Health at the University of Victoria, and our, our uh, other collaborators, uh, as well as the Victoria Hospitals uh, Foundation. And on the last slide, you can see the uh, 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 pictures of some of the uh, uh, folks working with us and some of the activities that we've been um, involved in. So thank you for your attention and I'll turn it back over to the uh, uh, moderators. Thank you, Alex and Christine. We would now like to ask you to answer a few questions about the Manning Cognitive Health Initiative. Prior to this webinar, were you aware of the Manning Cognitive Health Initiative? Yes or no. I know more about the Manning Cognitive Health Initiative than I did before participating in this webinar. Strongly agree, agree, neutral, disagree, strongly disagree. I'll give you a few moments to answer those polls. If you have any questions for Alex and Christine, please type them in the chat box in either of the two official languages and we'll get to them in just a moment. Okay, thank you for answering the poll. We'll go back to our presentation and open it up to Q&A and reflections. 
Keep your comments and questions coming, and what we don't get to today, we will answer and summarize in a post-webinar synopsis you will get within a few weeks to allow for translation. I will now turn it over to Mary Beth and Nini to share some reflections on what we have heard today. Thank you very much. Over to uh, Mimi, I just want to start off by saying these two innovations are, are very exciting. And um, in particular, I like how both are able to help people connect to other resources. So whether that's the navigator or the guidance system. And in addition to that, one of the things that people struggle with is um, walking out with something tangible. And I like how the guidance system you know, provided the report and also was able to connect to resources like First Link. Um, we know that the uh, navigator works. We've seen it before in other countries. So I think both are two really excellent innovations, and I look forward to seeing how they move forward. What do, you, what do you think, Mima, Amy? Uh, thank you, um, Mary Beth. Um, I agree with your points. And just to add, um, I think what this has shown to us is um, the importance of an integrated system in terms of a patient's journey. Uh, an individual with, living with dementia, their journey through um, the system from diagnosis to uh, connecting to resources and how important individuals play to help make those connections who are familiar with the services that are available. I think very often what we've seen is that, that although a diagnosis is made, that very often the individual making the diagnosis is unaware of what's available and those mm -hmm. in the community are not always aware of what's available to support an individual. So the navigation role, um, I think, proves here a critical point uh, in terms of enhancing and improving the support of uh, people living with dementia. I think the other thing it brings out, and I, I mentioned it earlier, was the idea of technology and the comfort that people yep. do have with telemedicine and virtual uh, health uh, delivery that I think can then even enhance and support uh, the care um, and support of individuals um, with uh, diagnosis, timely diagnosis, and a connection to support services. Good point. Great. Over Thank back. you, Mimi and Mary Beth. Very insightful contributions. Um, so we've got a couple questions that have come through. One question for Mimi uh, was about that you stated 65% of seniors own a smartphone. Do you have data on how that breaks down by age group? Um, the, the person asking said that they find that patients over 80 rarely have a smartphone. Do you have any insights into that? Um, I'm, I'm sorry that I can't, but they can, people can check the um, AgeWell website. I think the results of the survey that was done by AgeWell through en Environics Research is there. I'm not quite sure if it was broken down more finely, but it, it's interesting because um, I not only live with somebody who's um, an older uh, older adult, um, but I am familiar with uh, individuals. And I think probably there's a real split um, that you see more uh, in the younger age group, but I think um, it's important to, to check the results. I'm not quite sure if it was broken down more finely. Thank you, Mimi, and we'll be sure to link to the results that you mentioned in the post-webinar um, synopsis. Great. Uh, also, Dr. Henry Bergava has said that anybody who's asking about whether they can see the MyCog help, he's posted a link in the chat of a brief de uh, demo that's available. So anybody who'd like to check that out, the link's in the chat box, and we'll also link to it in the post-webinar synopsis. One other question that came through for Shelley and Allison. How has this Navicare model been adapted to provide referral to services and supports in the COVID context? Has technology solutions for supports been part of the options for support and services? Shelly and Allison, over to you. Great, thanks for the question. And so we, we haven't really needed to adapt because the model was already being offered virtually. We were doing some face-to-face, -face, but it was primarily virtual. So the only adaptation is that now we're, we're strictly virtual. And um, in terms of the way that some of the work has, we've had to, not much adapting the work, but we've seen 
a lot of the needs differ now. So the so when we have we have clients calling now looking for resources and services that um, they may now be COVID related or they may have lost services and resources they had access to prior, but now because of COVID they don't have access to it. So that would be one of the things our patient navigator spent a lot of time doing in the first three to four weeks during uh, when when the COVID pandemic hit was to really become familiar with all of everything that was going on within the province around the how different programs and services were affected by COVID and also any um, different services that could help support these families, whether they be government funded, federally or provincially, to help uh, to help support these families. So that would have been the major adaptation too, was just trying to make sure that our navigator was up to date on what services and resources were even accessible to be navigating our families too. And I'll just as Allison Luther, I'll just add one thing to that, something that what Shelley's getting into there is it's a really key part of a pa patient navigation is that the patient navigator needs to be sort of regularly on top of, so spending time really familiarizing themselves with what's changing with programs, what's new, what's been, you know, the, the, what, what, what funding's available, all that stuff. And that's really what takes, you know, that's, that's the heavy lifting that we can then take away from families or caregivers or patients because that's, it's just, it's overwhelming and especially during COVID. Great, thank you, Shelley and Allison. Those are the questions that we've got for today. So I will just say a couple of thank yous. I would like to thank Shelley, Allison, Christine, and Alex for their presentations today. I would also like to thank Mary Beth and Nini for their thoughtful reflections and comments. Thank you to our producers, operators, and simultaneous interpreters for their efforts in making this webinar happen. Finally, thank you to you all for joining us today. In just a few moments, I will read out a few CQI questions your answer to these questions help us plan our future webinars. So I will read out the polling questions for you. Overall, I was satisfied with my webinar experience. Overall, I was satisfied with how I was able to actively participate in the webinar. And do you have any other comments or suggestions to improve the content shared in this webinar? Once again, Thank you to everyone, and we look forward to seeing you at our next webinar in this series on November 17th. Thank you. This concludes today's webinar. Thank you, everyone. You may now disconnect.